Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. wanted to talk about some subjects that I covered for some training that I did for work a little while ago. Some of it applies and I think it'd be helpful for the general consumption. So whenever you go to a website and you see this HTTPS or HTTP stuff, you know, what does that mean? When do you care? Should you care? That kind of stuff. And the answer obviously is yes, you should care. That's why I'm doing this video. So we have up on the screen here, you notice the HTTPS and there's a little lock icon next to it. So what is this lock icon for? Why does it matter? All that good stuff. And really why it matters is we're trying to achieve a secure connection with whatever website we're going to. Now certificates extend well beyond just going to websites, but for now this is what we're talking about. We'll cover some more of the different use cases later, but this means, this lock icon means something. And to explain what it means isn't as simple as saying, well, it means you're secure. Yes, of course, it says you're secure, but that's a bunch of words on a screen. Why does that mean that you're secure? So, and can it say that you're secure and you actually not be secure? That's actually possible too. So we're kind of going to get into that a little bit. Uh, if you notice when you're at your banking website, same thing, you got some kind of, you, you you better you better have HTTPS if you're going to to your banking website, and this lock icon, whether it be uh, Chrome, Firefox, i.e., whatever browser, Safari, whatever browser you may use, this lock icon will be somewhere or some kind of representation that you're in a locked, quote unquote, secure site. Now, if we click on this, we see a couple things that are interesting. So. We say we we have here that it says it's secure, and then there's a little note down here. This is kind of rare that you see this. Parts of the page are not secure, such as images. So, what does that mean? And you you don't really know unless you dive into the page itself, the code of the page itself, and try to decipher what's going on. And and we can do that as well. And we can cover this real quick, just the way we we can look at this here. So. I'm on a web page, I, I notice this, and, and obviously most of the time you go to your banking website, you see this page, you click log in, and you're going in. You're not clicking on this unless you're maybe watching this video, and you might do it a couple times after you watch this video, but generally people aren't clicking on this, obviously. But anyway, suffice it to say, you can go to this website yourself. You'll see the same thing in your browser if you're running Firefox. I don't know if you're going to get the same message in um, Chrome or IE, whatever. Anyway, so if we hit F12 here, and we're going to see the source of the page, so how the, how the page is made up. So there's a bunch of links here you're going to see. There are some HTTPS links. So we got right here, there's HTTPS. Uh, I think there's a few more on here. So these are all links to stuff. So this is segment.net JavaScript. Um, we have another CDN segment.net. There's some other garbage here for doubleclick.net. Well, I don't know. That's odd. Usually, doubleclick is an ad website. I don't know why a business would have that on their page, but whatever. I'm not really going to get into that right now. But I'm guessing this Google Ad Services right here that just is, looks like a, a regular HTTP link, non-encrypted. That's probably why you're getting that error up there. So, you know, do you care about Google Ad Services on here? It's running some kind of JavaScript. I'm guessing it's doing some kind of analytics. Obviously, there's no ads on here right now. It's doing some kind of tracking or analytics to uh, to kind of see who uses their website and how they use it. It's perfectly normal. A lot of people will use Google for, you know, data mining kind of. I think they call it business intelligence, where you know you're you're basically capturing everything your customers are doing. You know what they're clicking on, how many times they clicked it, who clicks on what. Uh, even to the point of what pages they go to, how long they stay on that page, that kind of stuff. That's all kind of tracking like that. Anyway, we're digressing a little bit here, but regardless, this is this certificate is a representation, uh, is the is the enablement to get to this website in a secure fashion. So, really, what we're talking about is the certificate itself. So, there's some more information here. It's verified by DigiCert. I can tell you, DigiCert is trusted. But what does that mean? So something's trusted. So in Firefox, again, in different browsers, you're going to have the same thing here. We have some information, very little information here, but we can actually view the certificate. So if I'm looking at the certificate here, I see who it's issued to, the common name. So if you go to the website, 
UWCW org, that's what this certificate is for. This will not cover bank.uwcw.cu.org or UWCW online.org, whatever. It has to be this web address, which we saw back here. Now, the next thing we're interested in after who it's issued to is who it's issued by, which is DigiCert. Now, that means that a Internet Certificate Authority, CA, has issued the certificate to UWCW org. The organization and the website. So you could go to this website, you could look at the details of the certificate and actually look at what we call the chain of authority. So here's the certificate, here's a certificate for the intermediate certificate authority, and here's a certificate for the root authority. And they all have their own, if you notice, they'll all have their own serial numbers. They'll all have their own actual public key. If we can find that here. So here's the public key, and obviously that's a very long set of hexadecimal 2048 bits set of hexadecimal numbers. This is what we grab when we go to this website. We grab the public key, and that's part of a key pair. So every certificate has a key pair, a private key and public key. So UWCW has a private key and a public key. They publish their public key. Here it is right here. Everybody can see what it is. And what happens is when I connect to this website, I'm asking for the public key. And there's some other things going on here, but I'm, I'm, you know, for the sake of time, and obviously we don't need to go too far into it, but when I ask for the public key, I take their public key, and I encrypt all my data with their public key, and only their private key can actually open it. So it's like I'm creating a lock that can only be opened by a certain key, and ideally the people who own that private key have kept it private, and nobody else can get to that. So really, what's the bottom line of what we're talking about here? The bottom line is, how do I communicate with my bank website in a secure fashion, knowing that everybody on the Internet can potentially have access to that communication between me and my bank? And that's why the entire TLS and SSL suites were created. We want to have secure communication with a website. It's as simple as that. Now, here's an example of a website with just HTTP. There's no HTTPS. Connection is not secure. If you're in a website like this, if you go to a place like this, you never want to put any of your information in a website like this. If I go to register, anything I type here, since this is an HTTP link, anything I type here, name, email, will not be encrypted. So does that matter? Probably not. I mean, name and email isn't that important. Your name and email are all over the place if you're online anyway. I wouldn't worry too much about that. But if it does get to a point where you have to type a password in, then you better put in a password that you don't care about, that you don't use anywhere else, and you don't care, don't be surprised if your account gets hacked into, you know, in a website like this, if it's if you're communicating via HTTP. Now, obviously, if I'm in this banking website and I create my, uh, my password and all that good stuff, it's going to be secure as long as this lock icon and HTTPS is maintained throughout. If I click the apply here, so we still have it here, I can apply for personal checking. And if I'm going to log in here, notice we're still secure. I'm going to log in. Now this website just the the URL just changed, right? The website didn't change. Well, the website actually did change. Webbranch.uwcu.org. Now if we look in here again at the certificate, let's view it again, and we're going to see who it's issued to. The subject is who it's issued to. So now, all of a sudden, we have a webbranch.uwcw.org certificate. Remember last time we saw the web, the uh, certificate was only for this website. Now it's for this website. There, now you don't have to have, the, the way they did this is unnecessary. You don't have to have a separate certificate for uh, each sub website. There's something called, uh, and, and you know, we're getting, we're getting a little far into this, but suffice it to say, we can do, there's a subject alternative name and you can add, you know, web branch. You can add ebanking. 
UWC org, you can add, you know, um, apply.uwc, and, and those are all aliases, or alternative names that will apply if you, in, in under one certificate. So that's, uh, that's kind of certificate 201 instead of 101 here, so we'll stop with that. Anyway, so again, I'm, I'm in a site where I'm putting my username and password. I always want to make sure that I am secure. Now, the reason this, this certificate is accepted is because somewhere in my browser, I have the chain of authority. Remember, we talked about the chain of authority. I have the chain of authority certificates, the root and the intermediate certificate and I accept those in my browser itself or on my operating system itself. So now what do I mean by that? What does that mean? So remember we talked about here's the website certificate. There's also a certificate for the certificate authority, the person issuing the certificate. There's a certificate for them and there's also a root level certificate. These servers are generally turned on, spun up, they create their certificate key pair and they turn them off and they put them in a locked cabinet. They are uncorruptible most of the time they are off. Now, if I go into my browser here, and every browser again is different, but you know, preferences, settings, preferences in, uh, in Firefox, I think it's settings in Chrome. And I go somewhere that has to do with security, and I look for something called certificates. So here's the certificate section of my browser, and I can view my certificates. So I can actually manage you can manage these certificates in here, and these are for the certificate authorities. Remember CA, we saw that, authorities? So these are all certificate authorities that the browser ships with that they decide to trust. So we're going to find DigiCert in here, which was a certificate authority that issued the certificate for the website we were just on. Here's DigiCert. You're going to have other various things that the internet has decided to trust. So that means that all of these CAs, and obviously, you know, you might be thinking to yourself, wow, that's a lot. I kind of agree. It's gotten a little out of control. And, you know, the more CAs that you trust, the less secure you are, in my opinion. So to keep it to a roaring minimum would be better. But, you know, it's not my responsibility. Anyway, so what happens here is everybody in here that you trust as an authority can issue certificates for websites that you go to. So if I go to a website, 123.com and they have a certificate and that certificate is signed by an authority that is not in this list even though it may be a valid certificate my browser is not going to accept it it's going to give me a warning it's going to say you know site is not secure blah 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 I think we've all seen that and conversely I could have been not hacked, hacked isn't really the right word, but I could have been compromised, this browser could have been compromised on this system, I could get some malware, and they could insert certificate authorities in here without me knowing, and then I would go to, potentially go to a website that has a certificate that was issued by that fake certificate authority, and you would, it would look like a trustable website, and you would click on it and maybe put some information in it. Now, obviously that's pretty uncommon, that's pretty rare, but just giving you an idea of how this stuff works, and, and the basic premise that this only works because we all agree to it. We all agree to trust these people, and we all agree that they are trustworthy. We all, we all agree that they're trustworthy until we decide that they're not. So that's where your authorities are stored in your browser. There's also a place where your certificate authorities and your certificates are uh, stored in Windows, a separate location, and we'll get to that in a little bit. And as I said, I gave a presentation for, a technical presentation for my work a little while back, and I wanted to cover some of that. The, the idea of what we're talking about is who it applies to, when, where, and why. It applies to everybody, really, is the bottom line, and that may be obvious, but it's still worth saying. Everyone should be security-minded, whether it's will you lock your doors on your car or your home, you don't walk down a dark alley at 2 o'clock in the morning, different things like that, you know, physical security and digital security. And when we talk about digital security, we're talking about generally what websites you go to, what you click on, what you don't click on, and when, when you can trust a site or a uh, application that you're going to, when, when can you trust that and when you shouldn't.
So obviously applies to everybody. When is really all the time. And it's a little tough to say that realistically because, you know, when I'm sleeping, I'm not worried about security. But really, whenever I'm doing anything online, and frankly, personally, whenever I'm walking around, I'm thinking about this stuff. I'm thinking about, you know, am I putting myself in a position? Uh, are there people around me that I can trust? So on and so forth. That's how my brain works. Where... We talked about where a little bit in this for this what we're covering is digitally anything you do online whether it's email going to websites installing an application that you put your personal information into maybe a username and password you know if I install an app say for instance I'm installing some kind of Bitcoin wallet you know I'm putting my information into that I'm putting username and password I'm, I'm storing my my stuff somewhere that's all that that's all certificate certificates are involved with all of that and we should be very security minded when we're doing anything like that. And why is obvious. We want to avoid getting our identity stolen. We want to avoid malware and bad stuff on our, our devices and our computers, all that good stuff. So there's a lot to the certificates. There are, there's an encryption method. There's the actual communication protocol that it uses, how it communicates back and forth. How we talked about the key pair before the uh, the public and private key, how the the keys are exchanged, and all of this is separate technology that is individually uh, sometimes individually changes. So, for instance, encryption by AES that could change from 1024 to 2048. The signature hashing used to be, I think it was 128, now it's 256, and that's gone through various iterations and various versions. And we talked about the signed certificates from a certificate authority, we talked about the chain of trust, we can have self-signed certificates and that, that happens sometimes in corporations where they may have a device that is just self-signed and they don't care, they want to trust it, they don't want to deal with signed certificates and for them, you know, that's their choice. Uh, certificate file formats we're going to skip and PKI is the public key infrastructure, that is the set of servers and services that are set up to uh, to issue certificates, to validate certificates, to check on keys and all that good stuff. That's a whole set of infrastructure that's around for the, uh, the public key management. This is kind of a high level flow of what we've been talking about, how we can initiate communication with a server, how we can initiate secure communication, what the flow is back and forth, how we can start the actual secure link, not even starting the communication of uh, regarding what we even want from the website say if it's a banking website this isn't even getting to the point of getting our account list or, or our balance or anything like that this is just the initial steps it takes to establish a secure connection same thing with this slide this is a more detailed version of what we just saw or I guess detailed in a different way uh, some of the fundamental stuff here in blue is normal uh, communication when you're talking about IP at all it happens all the time and then you initiate the green part here your client hello server hello you're initiating the actual secure session here uh, you'll notice the SSL protocol on the side here on the left under client it's now called TLS SSL has been deprecated for a very long time now it's TLS which is uh, this SSL is not considered not secure anymore. We're up to TLS version 1.2. Some of this stuff on the slide, I would say, go look up the the nomenclature, the definitions on the internet. And if you want to know more, if you want to kind of get a deeper level, deeper dive here, we're going to keep it high level for now. This is some detail about the actual certificate itself. This doesn't really apply to a user of a website, someone who wants to get a service off of a website, this doesn't apply to you, you don't need to know this, but this is here for reference, so again, pause this and go look some of this stuff up if you're interested. So the only thing I would cover in these screenshots, this is a screenshot of a certificate that's been opened to view the detail on a Windows machine. You got your serial number on the left, you know, your valid from, your subject and your public key. And then on the right you have what's called a subject alternative name. We actually talked about that a little bit in the beginning of the video where we said, hey, you know, instead of having 
banking dot bank of america dot com and uh, electronic banking dot bank of america dot com and, and having all those domains have separate certificates you can add uh, alternative names to have one certificate cover many many different websites when we're talking about HTTPS we want to wrap our heads around when and where we use it we know that obviously we go to a website the certificates are involved however during email transfers application servers and various other services here listed here these all have some sort of secure communication and usually certificates are involved it's the same principle here where we want to maintain a secure connection how do we know how do we do that and we want to kind of be not on alert but we want to be aware of the websites we're going to and when they're secure if they if something looks something looks shady something strange is going on that sort of thing we want to we want to just kind of say you know something doesn't smell right here and maybe you do some more research and at this point we can talk about some high level summary stuff we just covered so we're going to say hey every time we want to go to a web page we should expect https in this day and age there's very few websites that are even http anymore so we're at a point where we can expect to use this and to see this https and the certificate stuff in every web page we go to if you're not putting any data into that web page user ids and passwords it doesn't matter as much but it's to the point where almost every web page is https at this point so if it's not then make sure what data is transferring you know is there anything going on in that website anything trying to uh, read your local system you can even just browse to a website and it can execute nasty things on your machine and you know that's not to say that just because it's https you won't get malware but with an http site you want to be extra careful if you're inputting any data if user ids passwords that sort of thing even searching and things like that who knows so this is generally what you're going to see as far as a malformed certificate or a certificate that's not signed this is usually a certificate that is not signed or it's self-signed what we call self-signed where it's actually issued by itself to itself and we're not interested in going to websites that have this this is not safe especially again if you're inputting any kind of data into that website so we want to go and click on some things there's various ways to do this we don't have to get into this too far but suffice it to say unless you know what you're doing avoid these self-signed sites so after watching this video I hope you at least have some concept of what you're looking at when it comes to certificates what the secure connection means when it when, when it's important what it means to you and just at a high level we're not looking to get super technical here yet I'll be putting out another video that will get a lot more technical on this and if you're interested please do some more research you know this could open up a door for you as far as a different mindset getting in a mentality of uh, paying attention to what's going on around you as far as your security other people's physical security and your digital security and taking that a little bit more seriously and not just being an easy target so i appreciate you watching and check out the next video from risk-based thanks